Hello, this is Vin Banj from Taylor Wessing. Welcome to our webinar today. Today's webinar is part of our regular webinar program where we bring you our expertise and views on topical data protection issues. Our regular attendees will be very familiar with our previous topics, which have included looking at challenges such as connected data, online behavioral advertising, cookies, data security and breaches. We've also taken deeper looks at data exports as well as the constituent elements of the GDPR, and I'm sure the GDPR topic itself will continue, no doubt, throughout our future webinar program as well. Recordings of those webinars are available if you miss them and still wish to engage in those particular topics. In fact, we have some 30 plus webinars to provide for you amongst our virtual data protection learning bank. Today, we will be continuing on the theme of data exports and looking very specifically at the EU-US Privacy Shield. As you will see from the slide on the screen now, Taylor Wessing is a leading international law firm. We act for a range of leading clients in local and international markets, providing a full service law firm offering. And we do so from our office footprint, which spans across Northern, Central and Eastern Europe, the Middle East, Asia, from North Asia all the way down and across to Southeast Asia, and also from our representative offices in the United States, and particularly on the west coast of the United States. We've listed more details about the firm on the slide deck for your reference. Today's webinar is brought to you by Taylor Wessing's International Data Protection Practice. Our team advises on all aspects of data protection and information law, and we do so from the office footprint that I've just outlined for you. And through that footprint, we offer a practice that is driven by a 22 partner specialist team. This is also complemented by our international network of data privacy specialists, so we can provide you with a true global one-stop shop data privacy support team. At Taylor Westing, we have a dedicated microsite specifically for all things data protection. That's our global data hub. From this site, you'll be able to access a weekly news update where we cut through the privacy noise and focus on key issues that have raised themselves in that particular week. We also look at topical issues where we take a regular look at those issues and challenges that are raising concerns and provide you with our views and thought leadership in those particular areas. You can also access webinars, our events from around the world that are forthcoming and also archived, and also see where members of the team uh, may be speaking at different events and presenting, uh, and also where you may be able to uh, interact with us on those particular events that are forthcoming. You'll also be able to access lots of other feature-rich content for example, our country pages that provide you with a snapshot of data privacy law issues for particular countries, and that's a, a growing number of country pages that demonstrate and provide you with more of our views and expertise as far as international coverage is concerned. My name is Vin Vanj. I head the data protection practice. I'm delighted that in today's webinar I'm also joined by Jean-David Bello, who is a Data Protection Specialist Associate, also based alongside me in the team here in London. So, as far as the agenda for today's topic is concerned, what are we going to be looking at today? Well, the focus is to update you on the Privacy Shield and all the things that are key and important that you should be aware of, and particularly from the perspective of the key considerations if you are thinking about certifying or if you've already certified recently and are wondering what the next steps are for you. Many of our attendees we know are from a range of countries around the world and also many of you are providing specialist support uh, from London uh, and from other jurisdictions outside of the US and we know that you also provide coverage for your US affiliates and your US operations. So you've asked us to look at this topic in particular so you can also be uh, informed or as well as informed as your teams that are based in the US in terms of what the 
um, EU US Privacy Shield is all about. And that's really where we're going to start on the agenda today, to bring this back to square number one, to build a picture of the EU regime on international personal data transfers, how we've got from the previous safe harbor scheme to the new privacy shield, outline what the privacy shield actually is, um, and also talk to you about some of those key elements that are involved and, and in, in the privacy shield so you can really get that uh, base knowledge of awareness. And then Jean David is going to run you through some of the key requirements for the Privacy Shield, particularly if you want to be a certified organization, working you through the principles of the Privacy Shield. And like all aspects of EU privacy law, the Privacy Shield is also principles based. So we'll be looking at some of those principles and just focusing in on some of those key areas and those key principles that embed the Privacy Shield to make sure it actually works for you and your organization and will make your certification fit for purpose uh, under the scheme itself. We're going to look at some of the uh, specific transfer-related challenges around implementing the Privacy Shield and also just looking at some of the more broader questions around whether or not the Privacy Shield is right for you uh, and what you should consider uh, if, if, if you want to actually embark upon certification. And then, in the usual way, we're also going to be polling some particular questions for you at the end of the webinar. So please do um, um, take part in the polling questions. It allows us to represent your aggregated view uh, on those questions, because we know from previous polling questions, and we know from feedback that we've had from webinar attendees that it's really useful for you to get a feel, get an understanding for what your fellow attendees are thinking and what those organizations that they represent may be thinking on those particular topic points. So please do click away and we'll represent those aggregated views to you very shortly after the polling questions close at the end of the webinar. We'll also be delighted to receive your questions as we go through the webinar please use the chat facility to send those questions through, and uh, we hope to make some time available at the end of the webinar to uh, provide you with our views and answers on any of those questions that you send in. So please, please do uh, send those questions in as you go along as well. So now we're going to take a look at um, the importance of uh, the Privacy Shield, and also the uptake and some of the initial success stories in terms of the number of companies that have already been successfully onboarded and accepted as self-certified companies as part of the Privacy Shield. So, in terms of the Privacy Shield itself, um, it is more than just a feature of, of law. Um, it is more than simply a data export solution that is out there and available but isn't receiving any uptake, it's actually quite the opposite. It's receiving quite a lot of uh, immediate take up. And, and just a snapshot of some of the companies um, that have already achieved the self-certification status uh, on, the, on the Privacy Shield um, uh, website and, and that scheme. Um, we've, we've presented some of those for you on the slide today so you can see. And indeed, there are many more. This is just a rather random snapshot to show you the range of US-based data importers uh, that have successfully self-certified to the Privacy Shield. And there are many more who have been going through the process recently um, and are still awaiting approval. So why is this such an important issue? Uh, and, and, and why are we really focusing on this subject today? Just to go back a step, and we've covered this before, but I just want to make sure everyone's on the same footing for this particular webinar. Um, the whole reason we have this concept and this challenge around data transfers or data exports, as they're often also referred to, is because there is an EU regime of international personal data transfers that set out in current legislation. 
And you'll find this in the Data Protection Directive 1995, the so-called current law, soon to be replaced by the GDPR. And you'll also find this regime on personal data transfer set out in local law that implements the 1995 directive. So as of now, each of the 28 EU member states will have their own data protection law, broadly um, applying the baseline that's been set out in the directive. And a fundamental part of that baseline is to provide for a restriction around data transfer. Why do we have this? We have this because there is this zone of data protection that exists across those countries within Europe and those additional member states, Norway, Iceland, Liechtenstein, that form part of the EEA. And so we have this European data protection zone. And within that zone, there is a common benchmark and baseline of data protection compliance to protect data and impose obligations on data controllers. And just because the data might leave the European area does not mean that the obligations and the rights that are attached to the data should somehow disappear. So there is a data transfer restriction for data that leaves Europe. And we've covered this in a lot of detail before, but it's just worth mentioning that baseline right now. So wherever the so-called third country is, in other words, the country that is based outside of Europe, which is not already deemed to provide that adequate level of data protection through an adequacy decision, then a solution has to be found to legitimize the export or the transfer of that data. There's the commonly used EU standard contractual clauses or the model clauses as they're often referred to, one of the solutions. There are exceptions built under the directive and local laws as well. So there are derogations built into that. For example, consent or more specific areas such as where data exports are required pursuant to legal advice or legal proceedings. Um, but those are quite limited and, and organizations have to reach for a broader solution. Now, the regime applicable to the United States was governed by the EU safe harbor framework between 2000 and 2015. And then since July 2016, we've had the EU-US Privacy Shield. And we also have the ongoing transfer of personal data as a principle and as a restriction set out under the GDPR. And you could see the very specific references to that as you look at the language and the text of GDPR where in Article 44 of the GDPR you'll find the broad principle that still addresses the point on restricting data transfers unless a form of adequacy or, or derogation is used. You'll find further detail on that in Article 45, which talks about the basis for an adequacy decision and where the Commission can issue an adequacy finding in respect to a country or an organization or maybe even a sector um, and, and, and it's under Article 45 in relation to an adequate decision for a country that you will find that the privacy shield is likely to be captured and caught and justified under the GDPR. There are also further references under, for example, Article 46, where there is specific mention in relation to binding corporate rules, and that's a fundamental difference between data exports expressed under the GDPR and data exports as expressed under current 1995 directive, which does not talk about BCR. So that's a, a fundamental move to encapsulate BCR very specifically, very expressly under the GDPR text itself. And we'll also see references to model clauses and how the GDPR goes beyond that to talk about other adequacy solutions, such as approved codes of conduct, for example. As well. So that's really just setting the scene on the current role and regime on data transfer restrictions. But we have had a bit of a journey over the last 12 months or so from Safe Harbor to Privacy Shield. And I know many of you, very many of you, hundreds of you in fact, tuned into the very first webinar that we did on this topic days after the collapse of Safe Harbor, where Christopher Graham the uh, very recently ex 
UK Information Commissioner, um, attended our webinar and also gave the ICO's view on, on that whole particular issue. And this has been around for some time. Uh, we've seen Safe Harbor in existence since 2000 as a well-used framework for the export of data from exporters in Europe to importers that have been Safe Harbor certified in the US. And then we saw the rather dramatic collapse of Safe Harbor in that no one was really expecting the timing of the collapse back in October 2015 um, under the so-called Schrems case, uh, which ruled that Safe Harbor and the adequacy decision that gave life to it had been invalidated. We went through this period of uncertainty then from October 2015 where we saw different opinions, different views on what needed to be put into place if anything was possible, a lot of political wrangling. Then we saw a draft of what the um, successor to Safe Harbor could look like, the so-called Safe Harbor uh, 2.0, as it was at the time. And then we saw that actually finally come into life on the 26th of, uh, um, sorry, in, in, in July 2016, um, where the EU Commission finally uh, laid down uh, an adequacy finding for the Privacy Shield and laid out what the Privacy Shield was actually all about. Um, and since the 1st of August, it's been open for self-certification. Uh, and of course, there's been a, a very small window uh, in terms of a grace period for onward exports that's been available. So there has been this uh, somewhat rush to, to, to seek self-certification by many organizations. So let's just start to explore what the Privacy Shield actually is. So um, before I hand over to Jean Divi, let, let me just outline what this really is. And some of this is really just noted for you on the slide uh, in, in front of you right now. It's a legal mechanism and it has an adequacy finding behind it that allows a transfer of personal data from the EU to a US self-certified organization, that third country data importer that would otherwise be restricted from receiving the data. And this is an adequacy decision, as I say, based on an, uh, the current EU Data Protection Directive. Uh, and it is very much a self-certification scheme, so it does bear some similar hallmarks to Safe Harbor. But as we will explore, it is much more than just a Safe Harbor Mark II or a 2.0. Um, it applies to both data controllers and data processors, uh, and processors must be contractually bound to act only on the instructions from an EU controller and assist the latter in providing uh, in responses and responding to individuals that may choose to exercise their rights under the Privacy Shield principles. And those principles, all seven of them, again, continue on the theme of the directive that I've just outlined. And will also continue into the themes outlined under the GDPR. Again, which we've outlined for you before, is a principles-based framework. Um, and we'll see there's more detail here, such as complaint mechanisms, um, more involved around enforcement actions, and, and annual joint review mechanisms. So more is added into the Privacy Shield than existed under Safe Harbor, and that figures because it needed to be more, and, it, and, it, and therefore the Privacy Shield is perceived to be more robust in nature than Safe Harbor. There are more checks in the process to ensure that organizations that are seeking self-certification actually are trying to live up to that. And uh, it will remain under review and that annual review so it doesn't fall out of current value. And it remains within the scope of data protection legislation. And we're likely to see, as the Article 29 Working Party pointed out, that the annual joint review mechanism must take on board uh, any further changes required to make sure that the Privacy Shield lives up to the requirements and expectations of the GDPR in time as well. So I'm going to hand over to Jean-David who's going to walk through some of the more uh, meteor elements of the Privacy Shield itself. Jean-David. Thank you very much, Vin. Um, we are now going to focus on the actual content of the Privacy Shield and go through uh, each of the Privacy Shield principles. But uh, before we do so, let's have a look at what the Privacy Shield route would look like as a, a certified organization. Um, so 
you should have um, on your slide the uh, diagram that, you, that we have um, prepared for you. We're not going to go through uh, the eligibility criteria and certification requirement in detail as we will deal with them in a moment. For now, we assume that you are uh, self-certified under the privacy shield. So you have your uh, certification. The first thing that you will have to do is, of course, comply with all the principles, including the supplemental principles. What you need to know is that the principles will apply upon certification. So once you certify, you have to comply with them unless you have applied before the 30th of September and you can benefit from that grace period that has been mentioned earlier to be able to deal with the onward transfer mechanism that we will talk about in a moment as well. The next uh, stage in this uh, privacy shield life cycle, as we call it, is the uh, privacy shield implementation. Uh, we will talk again about it uh, later on and, uh, and we will touch on it at the end of the webinar, but once you have your certification, you will have to put in place some procedures and you will have to amend your privacy policy to make sure that you comply with the principles. This goes with the next stage, which is monitoring compliance and the assessment of uh, your practices under the privacy shield. And that assessment could be a self-assessment that you will do um, yourself, or it could be carried out by a third party. This is again very important because uh, the US Department of Commerce will monitor effective compliance, including um, sending detailed questionnaire to you um, to identify potential issues if complaints uh, have been raised, or if there is any evidence of non-compliance with, with the principles, or if you have not cooperated uh, satisfactorily with uh, the U.S. Department of Commerce. The next stage, as uh, Vin mentioned earlier, is this joint review mechanism, which will be very important, um, where the Department of Commerce, the FTC, uh, the Ombudsperson, um, together with the European Commission, interested deputation authorities, um, representatives from the Article 29 Working Party, um, which represent the European regulators here in Europe, would discuss issues around the privacy shield. Um, and, and on that basis, after uh, uh, the joint uh, review mechanism, which will happen every year, uh, the European Commission will prepare a report that should be public, and you will be able to see uh, what, uh, what the outcome of the report is. And in our view, it is very important to have this mechanism because it makes the privacy shield a living instrument that will be able to adapt to um, what the technologies will be in the future, what the practices of the various US companies will be as well. So it is very important that you look for it as well. The next stage is the annual certification. Well, um, if you have not been happy with the privacy shield, you might not want to renew it. So you might want to withdraw from uh, the privacy shield. But bear in mind that uh, if you do so, so first of all, you will have to contact the U.S. Department of Commerce to do it. Um, they will remove you from, uh, from the list. But if you wish to withdraw from the privacy shield after one year or, or two years' time or more, uh, you will no longer benefit from the uh, adequate decision, which means that you won't uh, benefit from the privacy shield anymore. Um, and one important point to note is that if you do so, you will have to continue to apply the privacy shield principles to the personal data that, that, that you received um, while you participated in the, uh, in the privacy shield, and you will have to affirm to the Department of Commerce on an annual basis your commitment to do so for as long as you retain the personal data. Otherwise, the other option will be uh, for your organization to return or delete the information. So, you know, if you wish to withdraw, you will need to 
um, uh, think about the potential and practical consequences that may uh, lie on you. If you wish to renew, uh, you just have to, to pay the fee, of course, and I inform the Department of Commerce to do so. So on this practical life cycle, we have, of course, the data subjects which are at the heart of the, of the mechanism of the privacy shield. Uh, there are some, of course, mechanisms that we go through in a moment. Enforcement bodies and actions by the FTC and uh, the Department of Transportation. And we will not talk about it today, but the privacy shield on bonds person uh, who will deal with issues related to uh, surveillance and national security. Now, briefly, what you should do to prepare for your certification? Well, the first thing that you need to do is assess whether your organization is eligible to certify. What we mean by uh, eligibility means that um, if your organization is subject to the jurisdiction of the Federal Trade Commission, the FTC, or the Department of Transportation, then you may participate in the privacy shield. Uh, we are not going through the detail of whether you are going to be uh, excluded from the list or not, but uh, what you need to know is that you, either, you are either subject to the FTC or the Department of Commerce. There are some exceptions, and if you are in doubt, please contact the um, US Department of Commerce uh, a privacy sheet team and they'll be able to tell you whether you can apply or not. That's the first step that you have to do. The second step that you will have to, um, to follow is you will have to prepare a privacy shield compliant statement and that falls from the notice principle that we will go through later on um, which includes um, your declaration of adhesion to the privacy shield principles and once you have declared publicly that you adhere to the principles, uh, then your commitment becomes enforceable under US law. Um, you will have to identify your uh, selected independent recourse mechanism, again, we'll come uh, into it in a moment, uh, uh, indicate where your privacy policy is available, uh, insert the link to the US Department of Commerce, which is set out on the slide, and, and as I said earlier, comply with uh, the notice principle in full. In relation to the uh, independent recourse mechanism, well, it must be in place prior to your certification. And it is actually something that the US Department of Commerce will check when they uh, review your certification. They will see whether uh, you are registered with them if you need to register, so you need to select uh, your mechanism before. Uh, it must be free and accessible, and something to bear in mind as well is that if you are going to process uh, HR data, you will have to select the data protection authorities as uh, your independent mechanism. Of course, uh, if you are not processing HR data, you can use a private provider uh, or you can choose not to use uh, the DPAs if you are processing HR data but use other mechanisms described by Vin earlier such as the model clothes for instance. Then you will have to ensure that your assessment mechanism is in place and it has to do with what I um, uh, described earlier as your assessment uh, so you, may, you need to make sure that, that you have the right procedure in place. Uh, you will need to designate a privacy shield contact as well, because as you know, you have a duty to cooperate with the Department of Commerce and the DPAs where appropriate. And uh, if possible, if you have a, the name of a physical person dealing with privacy shield uh, complaints or, or, or queries, please put down that, that name as well. Then you'll have to review your draft self-certification. Um, it comes to the submission. You have to submit your certification. There is, of course, a, a fee to pay, um, and, and the uh, Department of Commerce provides some detail around 
what fees you have to pay, uh, and it is related to your uh, annual uh, revenue. Then your application will be reviewed by the U.S. Department of Commerce and, uh, and then published on the Privacy Shield uh, website. So this is what you are going to go through uh, when you will apply uh, for your self-certification. Now that you have applied, you, are, you have been successful, uh, that's great, um, you have to comply with the principles. And the first principle is the notice principle which means that um, you have uh, the obligation to um, provide information about, uh, sorry, to uh, the, the subject on key elements relating to the processing of the personal data. Um, this would include um, the participation in the privacy shield, the type of data collected, the purpose of the processing, uh, the right of access and, and, and the choice as well that will go through later on that the uh, individuals have and, and also additional information uh, such as um, the type of the identity of the third parties uh, who receive the, the personal data, uh, the contact details to deal with queries and complaints as I mentioned earlier if you have the name of a physical person dealing with complaints uh, please put it down. Um, you will need to add information around um, responses to requests by public authorities as well. And of course, um, an important topic which is dispute resolution bodies and mechanisms including arbitration. You will have to include arbitration uh, uh, in your information that you will provide to individuals because this is the recourse that they will have in addition to the other recourse mechanism that they will have available to them. One other piece of information that you will need to include is that you are subject to either the FTC or the uh, uh, Department of Transportation's powers and investigatory powers as well. And last but not least, the conditions for onward transfers and liability. One point to note is that each element uh, listed in the notice principle must be addressed through uh, the relevant privacy policy or policies. So make sure that you go through uh, all the elements provided in the notice principle. The next principle is the, uh, um, the uh, choice principle. So, with um, the choice principle, um, the purpose of the choice principle is to ensure that personal data uh, is, is used and disclosed in accordance with uh, the individual's choices. And the first uh, sub-principle is that individuals will have the opportunity to opt out and where personal data is to be disclosed to a third party or where personal data is to be used for a purpose that is materially different from the purpose for which it was originally collected or subsequently authorized by the uh, individuals. This also means that um, individuals must be provided with clear and readily available mechanisms to exercise their uh, choice. So what this means, for instance, in, in relation to, uh, to e-marketing, well, this means that uh, um, you will have to, to give the opportunity to, to individuals to opt out, uh, and they have this right to do so at any time. But of course, uh, this right to opt out at any time is subject to um, some limits, such as um, giving you time to, to make the opt-out effective and, 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 and you will um, also uh, require sufficient information to confirm the identity of the individual requesting to opt-out. So uh, it's at any time, but actually it's, it's quite um, uh, reasonable as well. 
Another sub-principle of this choice principle is that affirmative express consent for sensitive personal data is um, required if uh, the personal data is to be disclosed to a third party. Note that there is an, an exception here where that third party is an agent, i.e. a processor. Um, and affirmative express consent for sensitive personal data is also required if, uh, if the personal data is used for a purpose other than originally collected when uh, the individuals opted in. And again, uh, there are some exceptions for, for the sensitive personal data uh, where, for instance, uh, no affirmative express consent is required with respect to sensitive data uh, where the processing is one in the vital interest of the uh, data subject or another person. Second, necessary for the establishment of uh, a legal claim. Third, um, if it is uh, required to provide medical care or, or diagnosis. Fourth, uh, carried out in the course of legitimate activities uh, by a foundation, as a, a association, or non-profit body. So if you are non-profit body or an association, uh, you might uh, need to look into this exception. Uh, fifth, uh, if it is necessary to carry out uh, your obligations in the field of employment law. And, and, and last, uh, if it is related to data that are manifestly made public by uh, the individual as well, you will not be required to seek express consent. Now, in relation to HR data, um, uh, again, as you know, uh, the privacy shield has very specific provisions that govern uh, uh, HR data. And, and again, here, uh, that choice principle, you should not, uh, as an employer, restrict uh, the employee's uh, uh, ability to get opportunities, and you should not uh, 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 take punitive actions against employees as well uh, as a result of their choices. Now we are going to look at um, the uh, access principle. So the access principle is um, the right to obtain a confirmation of whether an organization is processing personal data related to the best objects, and that's why uh, the data must be communicated within a reasonable time if requested by the individual. And note that actually no justification is needed unless exceptional circumstances apply and are duly necessary and justified. And here you may be able uh, to ask for a fee provided that this fee is not excessive. This right of access also means that the uh, individuals have the right to correct, amend, or delete their personal data where it is inaccurate or has been processed in relation of principles. Now, in relation to HR data, um, as you may know, in Europe, employers must comply with local laws and regulations regarding access. And as a privacy shield certified organization, um, you will have the obligation to cooperate uh, uh, in providing access to HR data, either directly or through the European employer. Now, in relation to the uh, recourse of enforcement and liability principle, this is an important principle under the privacy shield because um, on the, uh, in the Schrems judgment that uh, that's been uh, described uh, earlier, one of the main concerns was uh, around the recourses that individuals in Europe may have against privacy shield organizations. And as a result of this, the privacy shield made sure that more robust mechanisms were available to data subjects whose personal data have been processed in a non compliant manner with the privacy shield principles. And those recourse mechanisms must be independent 
at, at no cost to the individuals. And the um, approach taken by the Khamisi Shield is what I would call a pyramidal um, approach where they would want actually the complaints to be brought first before the Khamisi Shield organization and then uh, uh, if the complaint hasn't been resolved satisfactorily, uh, the individuals may be able to use either the DPAs, if you have chosen the DPAs as a, as a recourse mechanism, or the private dispute resolution providers, if you have chosen the private resolution uh, 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 providers for dealing with your complaints. And then, they still have the option to, uh, to make a complaint before the DPAs anywhere locally in the EU member state, uh, and, and there is the option of arbitration. So you've got this pyramid of options for individuals. Enforcement, um, not that any failure to comply with the presentation is enforceable uh, under US law and subject to the uh, investigatory and enforcement powers of the FTC and the Department of Transportation. One thing to note is that there are some commitments uh, by the FTC and the DOT, and just look at this FTC's statement, which says, um, the FTC is committed to make enforcement of this framework a high priority and will work together with EU privacy authorities to protect consumer privacy on both sides of the Atlantic. And for us, it means that um, uh, it will, the FTC will really take care of this privacy shield and will make sure that all these principles are enforced appropriately as well. Liability, uh, which is the last set principle of this main principle, is that organizations uh, will have to take measures to verify that their privacy policies conform with the principle and in fact comply with. This is very important. And we have the same assessment of the audit. Uh, and in addition to all our transfers, uh, the privacy shield organization will have the responsibility for the processing of personal data it receives under the privacy shield and subsequently transfers to a third party acting as an agent uh, on his behalf. And of course, um, the presentation organization will remain liable. The next principle is the data integrity and purpose limitation principle, um, which is very close to what we have in the European Directive in terms of uh, purpose limitation principle, which means in a nutshell that personal data must be um, a, a process and limited to what is relevant for the purpose, reliable for its use, accurate, complete, uh, uh, and current. And the retention point here, which is new, is that data, personal data, must be retained in a form identifying or rendering an individual identifiable, um, and only for as long as it serves the purposes for which it was initially collected or subsequently authorized, unless exception applies. So again, um, what this principle means is that uh, personal data must not be incompatible with the purpose, and, and something that you need to consider is the access rights uh, that the data subjects have, what we mentioned in terms of opting out and the rules applicable to marketing communications as well as the rules applicable to sensitive personal data as well as we uh, outlined earlier. Now, the accountability for our transfer principle is um, an important one and we have outlined um, a flow chart for you to, to understand what it means. Um, and first of all, shall we start with uh, the definition of onward transfer, um, which I quote from the privacy shield, transfers our personal data from a, a, an organization to a third party controller or processor, i.e. an agent, irrespective of whether the latter is located in the United States or a third party or third country outside the United States. And this onward transfer principle applies to any and all third parties involved in the processing. So, take it simply, you will have your personal data sent from 
uh, the EU controller, uh, uh, and then uh, it will be sent to the US organization which is certified under the privacy shield, which will then uh, uh, transfer the data to a third party, either controller or processor, i.e. agent, uh, and that's what we call onward transfer. And the reason why it is important is because uh, there is a very specific regime that applies to uh, onward transfer, uh, and, and, and you will have to do some work in relation to onward transfer as well, because any contract argument that you have with your third parties involving an onward transfer will need to be uh, amended to, be, to reflect the privacy ship principles. So this regime is as follows. Um, an onward transfer can only take place first on the basis of a contract or comparable argument within a corporate group, which means that if you have uh, the EU their clause in place within your uh, corporate group of, of companies, that will, that will work. So on the basis of a contract with a third party, is a controller or processor, for limited and specified purposes, and only if the contract provides the same level of protection as the one guaranteed by um, the principles. Now, as I said earlier, there will transfer to a third party controller or transfer to a third party agent. When there's a transfer to a third party controller, you will have to comply with the choice and notice principles anyway because in your privacy policy, you will have described um, whether you will be transferring personal data to third parties. Maybe you will name them or at least identify them by type of third party. And on this slide, we have set out um, the elements that you will have to include in your contracts uh, when you are transferring personal data to a third party controller. So have a look at them because uh, this is something that you will have to include and maybe think about some warranties as well, additional warranties, and maybe uh, think about indemnities as well that you, you may want to include as a result of the uh, accountability for onward transfer principle. And again, for the transfer to a third party agent, you need to have a contract in place with a third party agent. Uh, and, 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 and again, have a look at uh, the principles and the elements on these slides to make sure that you include them in your contract and think about remedies uh, 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 that you may want to add as well. Um, there is one principle that we can deal with, which is the security uh, a, a principle, which was on the slide, which in a nutshell means that you will have to put in place uh, um, measures uh, to make sure that the data is secure uh, and, and again, uh, to ensure this, you will have to put in place a contract with the sub-processors, uh, which is linked to the accountability for onward transfer principle, which is a good transition for me uh, to, um, uh, uh, for Vim to speak about the transfer-related queries in relation to uh, the, the, the privacy shield. Vim. Thank you very much, jean David, for working us through um, the, the, the guts of, of the Privacy Shield and what that entails. Um, as we sort of reach the, the latter stages of, of our webinar, what we want to cover today, um, I think really just by way of wrapping up, I wanted to just outline some of the areas and some of the natural queries that we are seeing. And most of them really lend themselves to be encapsulated in a form of um, messaging around governance and accountability. Terms that we are becoming more accustomed to hearing as we explore GDPR, um, but also that's very much part of the practical steps that you need to think about after certification. And, and what we've outlined on the slide here are just some of the top tips uh, and some of the key points, and there are others I'm sure, but these are some of the key ones that we uh, come across for you to be alive to. So, you know, you'll have to look at uh, notifications to individuals and what your privacy shield statement looks like. Well, you know, make it live, live up to it. 
and make sure that your statements going forward uh, actually reflect what you have self-certified to and what your statement um, uh, actually has proffered as well. Um, any changes that you may need to make to policies and procedures, again, live up to them because the one thing that is clear when you look at the privacy shield as compared to safe harbor is that there is much more of a robust framework around privacy shield uh, in terms of the governance that is required, but also the veracity under which the um, authorities will, will, will be under an obligation and some pressure, actually, to make sure that they are at least seen to be enforcing. Um, so, you know, expect at some stage the regulators and the FTC and the DOC to be saying, well, you know, show us how you live up to this. What are your policies and procedures to live up to uh, your privacy shield certification? How do they manifest themselves? And if you retain the records that demonstrate that path to implementation and the remediation actions, um, even if they're not fully complete, how can you show that they're on your roadmap um, and where you are in terms of timeline? So governance playing a huge part of, of, of the steps around your self-certification and, and really the steps that you need to make sure are alive going forward. Um, and the same for the points that flow from that in terms of organizing your assessment with the principles and this ongoing form of self-assessment or indeed those that you would need to conduct against third parties. Um, John Levy's already highlighted the importance of renewing your certification and also being aware of the outcome of any review mechanism going forward. So, you know, um, it's time to think when it comes to certification renewal. Is this still appropriate? Is this still right as the solution that you adopt to uh, allow for the lawful import of that data to you uh, as, as the self-certified data importer? Um, and if not, what is the other solution that you may choose to put in place, whether that's model clauses uh, or whether that might be, as, as we're hearing from many of our clients, uh, moving towards perhaps a, a BCR solution as your preferred solution in the future, perhaps. But that's a time to actually make that determination uh, on renewal. There's also some points to be noted, uh, if you like, from the flip side of the coin. If you are um, contracting, if you're an exporter or part of the export chain and you are contracting with a party that is receiving the data in the US as a self-certified Privacy Shield recipient, then just consider some of those key steps that you should be going through as part of your process to understand um, how the third party will continue to provide uh, assurances that they will live up to the privacy shield. And due diligence is important not only from that process perspective, but actually also from the perspective of um, a, a, a appointing a data processor. So when you are looking at appointing a data processor or some contractor downstream, then there will inevitably be processor clauses that need to flow down, and alongside that is, is the obligations in relation to data security, um, that, that risk-based obligation, uh, and also the fact that you need to make sure that you are selecting suppliers and uh, importers that can live up to those obligations. And also, just doing some of that self-checking yourself as well. So looking at the listing and looking at the Privacy Shield wording itself, and seeing, well, does this actually cover the type of data that we are about to disclose and, and, and uh, impart to uh, a, a recipient in the US? Um, if it doesn't, then question whether actually you're doing the right thing uh, by disclosing that data in the Privacy Shield, and the answer clearly would be you're not, because that data wouldn't be captured. And it's not unusual uh, for an organization to cover part of their data estate with a particular um, a data transfer solution. For example, using Privacy Shield for um, employee data, for example. So it's quite important to check that um, if what you're involved in is actually customer data or consumer data or non-employee data, then make sure that the 
certification and the shield wording actually covers that as well. If not, you need to be looking at an alternative adequacy solution. And that may well be the right thing to do, uh, and it may well be the right thing to look at at the time you're making that assessment. And actually, as a, uh, risk, uh, uh, as a self certified importer under the Privacy Shield, these are the points you should be asking yourself. So if you cannot live up to those questions and those due diligence points that will be asked of you, then again, consider is this really the right solution for you? And whether or not you should be seeking an alternative solution or providing an alternative adequate solution. And those that we've already mentioned, for example, um, uh, model clauses, standard contractual clauses, or, or, or BCR. Um, the um, points just to be alive to as well, uh, and we will cover this in due course, is, and I've mentioned the word model clause and standard contractual clauses uh, several times, is we understand that the European Commission is undergoing a phase of reviewing the model clauses um, with a revision in mind. We understand, although we haven't seen any red line versions at all, uh, the focus will be rather similar to the focus that's been placed on the privacy shield. In, in, in other words, looking at those failures of safe harbor and those fundamental factors outlined in the Schrems case particularly around the rights and the ability of data protection authorities to, as we term it, lift the lid on the data export and the adequacy solution and have the ability to ask those fundamental questions. Um, and so we, we, we expect to see some revisions on that. Um, when they will come, we don't know. Um, I'll be surprised if they were more than six months away, uh, and I certainly wouldn't be surprised if they were in the coming months. But um, I am somewhat gazing at a crystal ball when I say that. Um, there are some additional points that we've highlighted on the slide for you. Um, and I'm not going to go through those in detail now. Um, we have very deliberately made today's slide deck quite um, heavy, um, quite wordy as you might describe in places, uh, because we wanted to provide that level of detail for you. And what we are going to do is actually make the slides uh, deck available for you when we send out the uh, follow-up uh, notice that we normally do after you've attended the webinar. So you, you should receive the slides just to provide you with the actual text that we've been talking through as well, given that they are so um, heavy uh, and, and, and therefore hopefully useful reference point for you. So what we wanted to do in the usual way, there are a couple of questions I want to come to as well in a moment, but I do just want to look at polling questions as well. And there are two polling questions that we have in mind in particular. And the poll should now be open on, on the first question. And that's really, again, just to help all the attendees gauge uh, whether or not you intend to self-certify with the Privacy Shield before the end of 2016. So you know, in, the short come, in the short coming period, in the, in the next sort of couple of months, is this something that you tend to do, whether that's yes, no, or at this stage, whether or not you don't know if that's the case. So please do. Click away and answer accordingly, um, and that will allow us to just report back in a moment uh, on the aggregated view that's expressed there. The second question is um, really uh, around whether or not, as a exporter, you would feel reluctant to accept uh, a vendor or a supplier under Privacy Shield um, um, and allowing them to receive your data as a Privacy Shield certified organization. And you know, we've talked about the fact that it is a valid scheme, that it is an adequate scheme, and there's an adequate institution behind it. Um, and so again, just let's gauge your views on that, whether no, you wouldn't. Um, or if actually you feel um, there are reasons um, uh, and, uh, as to why you would, uh, would feel reluctant. And for example, uh, yes, if you feel reluctant because it's just too new and you feel that it's a vulnerable area. Or you would, yes, you would feel reluctant if you think actually your specific data protection authority may have some issues around this. Or yes, you would feel reluctant if your customers or data subjects are actually requiring or swinging your mood in a slightly different direction. So um, just as we are, are, are seeing some of those results click through, 
Um, on, on the first question, um, the uh, feedback that we have is over a third of you uh, are saying, yes, you do intend to self-certify before the end of 2016, um, and, and over a half of you saying that it's not something you're uh, fully able to commit an answer to at this stage. Uh, so we know that at least a third of you, and we, we, we do have a significant number of attendees today, at least a third of you are intending to do so within uh, uh, the next couple of months and before the end of 2016. So um, sticking very much to the theme that we outlined at the beginning, that we are seeing more and more companies um, sign up to this. Um, on the second question um, around uh, do you, whether or not you feel reluctant to accept it, um, I'm quite pleased to see this actually. 66, uh, the figure's just still hovering, over 67% of you saying that no, you would not feel reluctant to accept vendors and the proof of shield. And that's reassuring to hear and see uh, because uh, it is an adequate decision as I outlined earlier on and one of the uh, you know, formal legal legitimization solutions that are uh, uh, available. Um, and then we have a split, uh, the, the largest category being 20% remainder have said that actually it's just too new and would feel somewhat vulnerable on that perspective right now. Um, only a small percentage of these 6% said uh, you, you'd feel reluctant because your data protection authority um, um, would, would have a slightly different mood swing on that. Um, so hopefully that's been of interest to you. Um, I'm conscious we're up against time, but I'm very quickly just going to take some questions here. Um, and um, one question that's coming is, you know, we, we, we have the privacy shield in place. Uh, will we be able to revoke the model clauses that we have in place with customers? Well, model clauses that you have in place with customers are an agreement that you have in place uh, between two parties. Um, two parties can always agree to uh, remove uh, an, an agreement. So you could reach a mutual position where you would say between you, model clauses are no longer the right governing solution. We have privacy shield and that's what we'll have in place. So it's very possible for you to do that. Obviously this depends on how and if the negotiation position is open for you. Bear in mind what I've just said around some customers who may have a reluctance to do that for a variety of reasons. Obviously going forward it's a slightly cleaner position. Uh, the easier if, if what you're offering is perhaps not the model clauses um, because you're offering um, privacy shield as your frontline uh, data import solution uh, into the US. Um, so it is very much possible that, and I hope that gives you uh, an answer to that particular question. Um, we've had another question which is um, quite complex, I'm going to touch on this still, uh, which is you know, for, for a Canadian company um, with servers in the US, um, customers from across Europe and the UK. Uh, data privacy is a constant topic for our customers, uh, such as European customers, as our servers are in the US. So are we able to be certified as a Canadian company or only uh, a US company can be certified under the Privacy Shield? Well, um, the, if we were to think back to that slide, just a couple of slides back, when John David talked about how the flow of onward exports would actually work. The absolutely key point here is um, does the data ultimately end up in the hands of a recipient in the US? In which case the data resides with an importer in a third country. So a solution has to be found and the entity that is controlling um, or, or, or otherwise responsible for the service in the US, which may be an affiliate, it may, may, may itself be a third party, um, will need to demonstrate adequacy for you, either through model clauses um, or themselves being Privacy Shield certified. Um, of course, there's lots of variables um, that would also need to be explored here as well. And I think one is really working through this on a factual perspective, you know, and key to understanding all the parties involved and overlaying that against who is the exporter, the ultimate data controller entity from Europe, um, who is the importer in the third country, which it seems to be in Canada in here, and then who is that data sort of onward exported to? 
which in this case is not an onward export under the privacy shield, because Canada is not able to take advantage of the privacy shield. It's US companies only. Um, and then what is the mechanism of adequacy for that onward export? Overlaying that against the actual technical infrastructure and the flow of the data is what's ultimately going to help that particular uh, analysis. Uh, but thank you very much. It's a very interesting question to have, nevertheless. Um, so just as we begin to, to, to wrap up now, um, please also look out for our other uh, events. As I mentioned, the Global Data Hub has uh, all the information you need. Our next London-based data privacy event will be on the 16th of November, where again we're going to look at the subject, but also more broader and specific issues around other data export uh, challenges. Um, so uh, look out for that. Our next webinar is scheduled for the 22nd of November, where we'll delve further into the GDPR, especially looking at um, uh, concerning points around consent and special sensitive categories of personal data. We really hope you can join us for those up and coming events and webinars. But for now, from Jean David, myself, and the team here, thank you very much for joining us, and goodbye.